Good morning. My name is Michael Ross. I am a uh, small group leader and a uh, volunteer here at Willens. And I just want to welcome everyone who's here uh, with us physically. And big shout out to anybody who's online. Today is a, a very special day. Can you, can you guess why? Yeah, because it's Sunday. <laughs> per Google, today is National Automotive Service Professionals Day. Did you know that? <laughs> also, it's National Children's Day. So, kids, if you're listening to this, you get free ice cream from your parents today, okay? Um, also, Google said it's National Jerky Day and National Peanut Butter Cookie Day. <laughs> How about you? you know we had so many days? Uh, I want to I say thank you to all our volunteers, all the people who work in the, uh, the security team, the uh, volunteers who uh, work the, um, the, tech, the tech booth, and I just want to thank, uh, uh, give a round of applause to any, any person who volunteers their time to help this church operate. All right. And we're going to move into, we're going to continue with our worship uh, through our giving. And to prepare, to prepare our hearts for our giving, I want to read to you Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22 and 23. It reads, be sure to set aside a tenth of all your fields. Well, not. Be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year. Bring this tithe to the designated place of worship, the place the Lord your God chooses for his name to be honored, and eat it there in his presence. This applies to your tithes of grain, new wine, olive oil, and the firstborn males of your flocks and herds. Doing this will teach you always to fear the Lord your God. There's two things I want us to to, to, to gather from this passage. Number one, he says to set aside, be sure to set aside, and to, to kind of help us understand what it means to set aside, I'm going to use an analogy of apple pie, okay? Imagine you have two apple pies. One apple pie, uh, you, you guys sit on the counter, and uh, you guys cut the pie up. Dad serves mom, dad serves the children, dad serves himself, and dad serves his neighbors, his friends, and you guys feast, and then you kind of what is, what's ever left goes to God, okay? That's one, that's one picture. That's not tithing. I've been, I've been guilty of that in my life, okay? And uh, I'm sure there's some of us that are living in that, that are operating in that, in that manner today. The second pie, you guys lay it out on the counter. You take a small slither of it, 10% of it, and you cut it out and set it to the side. And then you live off of the 90% of the pie. That's tithing. And what I found in my life is that the 90% is more than sufficient. I can, I, can, I can have a slice, my wife can have a slice, my children can have a slice, and some of my friends can have a slice. But that's, that's the picture of, when it says set aside, that's what I want you to envision, the pie. Also, he says that doing this will teach you to always fear the Lord your God. The Bible has a lot to say about fearing the Lord. Proverbs chapter 1 tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And one of my, they, they just sang one of my favorite songs. Um, uh, and, and, and in that song, the, the, the person who wrote the song, he says, show us who you are. The song is build my life, but he says, show us who you are. What Proverbs is telling us is that there's no way to gain knowledge. There's no way to see God. God will not reveal himself to you if you don't fear him. And what Deuteronomy tells us is that tithing teaches us to fear the Lord. Okay. That's not me speaking. That's the word of God. There's three ways to give, and you can text to give, you can give online, or you can give in person. Choose, choose the one that works best for you. Choose the one that works best for you. I prefer to set it up online so that I can, whether I'm here or not, rain, hail, sleet, snow, I tithe. I, the, giving online enables me to faithfully give to God as he is faithful to me. Okay? Um, so, but if you're, here, if you're here as a guest, if, if you're here for the first time today, you're our guest in every way. Please don't feel obligated to give. Okay, we don't want something from you. We want something for you. In fact, if this is your first time visiting, we have something for you. Okay, we have a gift for you on your way out. Just collect it at the, uh, at the desk uh, on your way out. Uh, announcements. We have two announcements today. Um, please mark it on your calendars. Woodlands Children's Ministry presents... Level Up Kids Camp. It's uh, occurring between, uh, from July 24th to July 28th. And there's a table set up here at the back of the uh, worship center. If, you, if you're interested in learning more about it, just stop at the table over there. 
Also, we have our Honor Fathers 5K Run Walk this, uh, this weekend, this next weekend, next Saturday. Uh, it's sponsored by One Day at a Time Ministries, which is my not-for-profit. Um, the purpose of this race is to, one, honor fathers, to acknowledge dads, but also to raise awareness to the negative impacts of fatherlessness. The race happens, uh, it starts at, um, it's on Saturday uh, from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. If you're interested, please visit www.odatmin.org to gain more information or to register. Or you can come talk to me and I can, I can direct you. If you also, also if you're interested, interested in volunteering, let me know. So if you will please rise, if you're able, for the reading of God's word. Our reading today comes from the book of Luke, chapter 8, verses 1 through 15. And it reads, Soon afterward, Jesus began a tour of the nearby towns and villages, preaching and announcing the good news about the kingdom of God. He took his 12 disciples with him, along with some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Among them were Mary Magdalene, from whom he cast out seven demons, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's business manager, Susanna, and many others who were contributing from their own resources to support Jesus and his disciples. One day, Jesus told a story in the form of a parable to a large crowd that had gathered from many towns to hear him. A farmer went out to, to plant his seed. As he scattered it across the field, some seed fell on, on the footpath where it had been stepped on and birds ate it. Other seed fell among rocks. It began to grow, but the plant soon wilted and died for lack of moisture. Other seed fell among thorns and grew up, and grew up with it and choked out the tender plants. Still, other seed fell on fertile soil. This seed grew up and produced a, a crop that was a hundred times as much as, as much as had been planted. When he had said this, he called out, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. His disciples asked him what the parable meant. He replied, you are, permit, you are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of God, but I use parables to teach the others so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. When they look, they won't really see. When they hear, they won't understand. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is God's word. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message only to have the devil come and take it away from their hearts and prevent them from believing and being saved. The seeds on the rocky soil represent those who hear the message and receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they believe for a while. Then when they, then they fall away when they, when they face temptation. The seeds that fell among the thorns represents those who hear the message, but all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the cares and riches and pleasures of this life. And so they never grew into maturity. And the seed that fell on good, good soil represent honest, good-hearted people who hear God's word, cling to it, and patiently produce a huge harvest. And this is God's word. You may be seated. All right. Thank you so much, Michael. Appreciate it. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, did you manage to get in ahead of the rain? No. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. Um, uh, my wife, uh, Ruth, and I were looking at that, the weather patterns last night, and we're like, well, there's supposed to be a break between like 10 and 11. Hope it'll hit right. No, it hit right at 10, 15 as everybody's trying to make their way in. So thank you so much for braving the weather and coming on out. We're going to make it worth your while here this morning. I'm sure it already has been, right? That great worship set. Wasn't that amazing? That was amazing stuff. Love that song, uh, Waymaker, as a uh, um, Emily was uh, leading us in that and talking about that. Um, uh, just uh, let me introduce myself first of all. My name is Daniel, and I serve as the lead pastor here at Woodlands. And I want to welcome the people watching online, as well as all of you here uh, in, uh, in the house, so to say, as well. Um, real quickly, I just want to uh, briefly uh, revisit. Last week, we passed out a card. It was in your worship folder. It, was, it said, Your Passion, Your Calling. All right, and I want to thank you, all right, because many, many of you signed up for different things that you would like to be part of to help make a reality here at Woodland. So thank you so much, and I really, really appreciate that. We, we got those. Um, they were all given to me uh, on a, uh, you know, a sheet of paper here. So I've got all your names and all the different things that you signed up for. Several of you signed up for multiple things. That was pretty cool. Um, if you want to sign up today, we do have more of these cards. There's uh, some at this high boy table over here.
here, and there's some out this way as well. So if you would like to pick this up and say, yeah, you know what, I'd like to help out with one of these areas of ministry. Basically, we're just dreaming. We're dreaming about what God could do here at Woodlands. And we believe that God could do big things here at Woodlands. And I was just sitting here as we were praying and we were singing and worshiping. And, you know, and, and, and the song was talking about you know, the, the miracle worker, right? Uh, that God is the miracle worker. And the Lord, one miracle would be to see this worship center completely packed, you know? And then we have another service and we completely pack it again, you know? And just, uh, just so that we get the word of God out to more and more people. And I believe that a lot of these things are things that are going to help us reach our community with the love of Jesus Christ. Uh, not just our community, but our world at large. So take that. I hope you can take a chance to... Uh, uh, fill that out, and uh, you can just leave it. When you fill it out, you can just leave it right on the table where you uh, got it from. So uh, today, um, we're going to continue in our series in Luke. Uh, it was interesting. I was just uh, kind of doing some assessment of where we've been. We have, uh, this is the 32nd message that we've done in the Gospel of Luke, and we're starting chapter 8 today. And... If you don't know, there's 24 chapters in Luke. So I personally think this is amazing. You know, we are do, doing a very thorough, a very uh, in-depth, verse-by-verse look at the life of Jesus as was been recorded by uh, the brilliant uh, Dr. Luke here in his gospel. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, I want to say that uh, also uh, next week, um, though, we are breaking from this series. We're going to have Father's Day, and we're going to have a great Father's Day message uh, for all the dads. Quite frankly, it'll be a great message for all the men. Uh, uh, so get them, get them out here uh, next week. Come on out if you're watching online. Got to be here in person next week. And for you ladies, you'll want to be here because, as I, can, I, can I just tell you, as a pastor, I love nothing more than beating up on guys. Right? So it's going to be a lot of fun for you ladies, okay, uh, at, at that point. And men, now don't get worried, all right? Um, I promise you when I say that, I mean I'll simply be challenging you uh, with the good news of Jesus and that you're going to walk out of here encouraged and fired up uh, to be a better man of God, so to say. And then uh, the week after that, June 26th, we're going to start our summer series, and I'll give you more on that next week. Now, I've always deeply appreciated people who work behind the scenes. I mean, I've been an upfront person my entire life. I was 16 years old when my home church put me up on the platform and had me preach my first sermon. And so I've always been upfront uh, in, in that sort of way. And the things that I do, I tend to be upfront where people can see me. Um, and then, uh, um, uh, so I sometimes, though, I personally sometimes get to do things that nobody sees, right? I, I get to see that, that but I got to be honest with you. I mean, I, there's people I know who are behind the scenes people, and they really, really want to do their ministry and their service behind the scenes. I mean, they don't want anybody knowing about it. They really don't want anybody knowing about it. When I do things behind the scenes, I kind of want you to know about it. Right? I mean, I'm serving the Lord and nobody's watching and I'm kind of thinking, oh, if they could see me now. Right? Right? As a matter of fact, like for instance, how I sometimes mop this floor in here. You know, like, like when we don't have somebody to come and mop the floor, you know, I'll, I'll get the old bucket out and the soap, and, and I'll just be in here by myself, and I'll just be mopping this floor, which I kind of like that because when I was in college, one of the jobs that I had was to mop the floor of the dining room uh, where all the, all the students ate, and it was a lot of fun. My wife and I, Ruth, were just starting to date back then, and I usually would do it from 10 to midnight, um, uh, five nights a week. And uh, she would come down, and I'd, you know, with the access I had to the dining room, I'd, I'd let her in, and uh, she'd enjoy a nice bowl of Frosted Flakes, uh, right, uh, while, while, while I was there doing the work. You know, I, I, I actually, back then, I was foolish enough to think she was coming to see me, right? But she was, uh, but, you know, the Frosted Flakes were really the draw, right? And so, um, but so, so, you know, mopping the floors, doing something like that, I... I do enjoy doing that. I do enjoy, it's kind of nice that I can do a little secret service for the kingdom. Oh, darn, Mike. 
I don't think my secret service is secret anymore. I think I just told you all what I do behind the scenes. Sorry, public people are so public. I, I, uh, <laughs> I know that annoys some of you. I apologize. Today we begin with Luke telling us about three women. Uh, three women, he just mentions them in passing. Uh, but if you stop and think about it, their secret service that they did has massive implications uh, for the kingdom. In Luke chapter 8, uh, we're going to look at verses 1 through 15. And verse 1, it says, Soon afterward, Jesus began a tour of the nearby towns and villages, preaching and announcing the good news about the kingdom of God. Now, so Jesus has spent some time in Capernaum. We've looked at a map before. And on the map, we know that the Sea of Galilee, which is north of Jerusalem, Capernaum is on the northwest corner of the Sea of Galilee. So Jesus spent a lot of time up there doing ministry, preaching in the synagogues, which would have given him a mostly Jewish audience. But now we see he's going out town to town, which would give him a greater diversity of audience of people who could hear him speak. Um, now, as he went out to the villages, his purpose, Jesus' purpose, you've taken notes, you want to write this down, is always to preach the good news about the kingdom of God. That is always what Jesus a kind of his bottom line. That's always the thing that he most wants to do, is to preach the good news about the kingdom of God. We here at Woodlands, we must always keep this as our primary objective. Preaching, teaching, sharing the good news about the kingdom of God. Telling people how they can be saved from this world. How they can find eternal life after this world is over. Now, here at Woodlands, I mean, we do a lot of things here at Woodlands that are really, really good things. I mean, you know, we, we do a lot of work to feed the poor. We pray. We pray hard for each other. We pray for our community. We serve the elderly in different ways. We uh, are, are, are really throwing our hat, and we've already done some work in this area, but we want to do more in terms of rescuing slaves from sex trafficking. We support fathers, uh, like uh, was talked about in the announcement, right? The men's, or the, it's not just for men, but it's the, the, the race, uh, the 5K race walk next Saturday, right? We hope, I hope many of you will sign up for that so we can support fathers. Uh, Mike's uh, nonprofit, One Day at a Time, is all about supporting fathers and helping fathers be better dads so they can raise better kids, right? It's one of the most critical needs we have in our society today. We care for orphans and widows and single mothers. We encourage those who are father fatherless, those who have lost their dads. Um, we provide backpacks for needy children. Uh, we build relationships so that people can heal their broken relationships. We grow organic vegetables and fruits in a big old garden right over here. That's right. That's right. And we give away literally, this is crazy, folks, tons of vegetables and fruits to local food pantries. And also for other people, especially people who are part of the church, who may need a little extra help, you know, with their, with their food and such. That sort of, all these things are great things. They are good things. They are biblical things. They are Christ-centered things that we do. But if we don't share the gospel, the good news, if we don't tell people how to be saved, we are missing the point. If we fill somebody's belly, but we don't tell them about Jesus and how to get to heaven, all we've done is made them better fill, we, all we've done is make them more filled up on their way to hell. All right? And so that, that's not the end game. I mean, you think about it. If you like sports, I like sports, you know, basketball, football, other sports. You, you want to be ahead at halftime, right? You want, to ha you want to have more points than the other team at halftime. But if you're not ahead at the end of the game, you lost the game. No matter how good a first half you play, you got to have the second half to go with it to win the game. And that's kind of what this is. The first half is us doing things to love people in our community, to show them the good news, to show them that we love them, to show them that we care about them. But that's just halftime. If we aren't telling them about Jesus and telling them how to be saved, then we don't win the game, so to say, if you can play that analogy out. 
From the beginning, and when I say from the beginning, I mean all the way back in Genesis. From the beginning, God has been building a family. That's what he's doing. He's building a family to spend eternity with him in the heavenly kingdom. He wants all of his creation to be saved. Several times in Scripture we read that, that God wants everyone to be saved. He also says that his return is being delayed for the purpose of more people being saved. So sometimes when you're wondering, man, I mean, when is God going to come back? How much worse does it have to get? You know, we have all this going on, all that going on. And what you need to understand is he is purposely delaying his return to give you and to give me more opportunities to share the good news with people about his kingdom so that when he comes back, they'll be saved and their destiny will be heaven and not hell. And that's why sharing the good news, being willing to risk all, that is to go all in and serve all, humbly doing whatever it takes to save all in Jesus' name, has been and always will be our first priority here at Woodlands Community Church. I mean, you think about what Jesus did. Jesus did a lot of amazing things, absolutely miraculous things, in order to reach people, care for people, show his uh, divinity, if you will, that he's holy, that he is God, right? But here's the thing. The miracles of Jesus did not prove that he was God's son, necessarily. As a matter of fact, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, you'll know that Elijah and Elisha essentially did everything that Jesus did in terms of miraculous works. So what was his purpose? Jesus' purpose of the miracles was to give us a taste of heaven. The miracles were signs to show us what will be in the kingdom of heaven? Take, for example, he fed the 5,000. Uh, if you've read about this, there were 5,000 men. That means with women and children, there were at least 20,000 people there. All he had were, were five loaves of bread, basically hamburger buns. All right, if you want to tell what it, what it was, okay? I mean, they weren't even the long baguettes, right? These are like little hamburger buns. And he had two fish. And with that, he fed over 20,000 people. And it tells us that there were 12 basketfuls left over. 12 basketfuls left over. What that shows us is the abundance of the kingdom of God. That there is great abundance in God's kingdom. And that in the kingdom of God, nobody will ever go hungry again. That's the sign that he was giving us. Jesus healed those with leprosy. And he did it. And, and, he, and when he did this, he healed them of their skin disease and he healed them of their sicknesses, showing us that in the kingdom of God, there will be no more sickness, there will be no more disease. Amen? He fixed a man's shriveled hand on the Sabbath. Now, it's critical that he made him whole, but what's really important is that he did it on the Sabbath because the Jewish leaders and such people, they were angry with him because he was doing, quote, work on the Sabbath. So when Jesus fixed the man's shriveled hand on the Sabbath, when he healed him, what he was saying was showing care and compassion for people always takes precedent over religion. All right? Because sometimes we actually use our religion as an excuse to not show care and compassion for somebody. Think about it. Maybe you're on your way to church on a Sunday morning and you see somebody broken down by the side of the road and they got a flat tire. And maybe it's a, it's a woman who's got several kids in the car, but you can see there's no one there. There's not a man there who can go and, and help change that tire. Now, ladies, I know you're tough and you're strong and you can do anything, all right? But I'm just telling you, changing a tire takes a lot of muscle, all right? Because those, those lug nuts are locked on there. All right, and so, hey, you know, if your excuse for not helping is, oh, I would help, but I don't want to be late for church. You just made religion more important than compassion, all right? And Jesus came along, healed a man's hand on the Sabbath and said, uh-uh, 
Compassion is more important than religion. Look what else he did. He gave sight to the blind, both the physically blind and the spiritually blind. In the kingdom of heaven, there will be no more blind people, and there will be no more spiritual blindness. He made the lame walk. I think about that. In the kingdom of heaven, there will be no more wheelchairs, there will be no more walkers, and there will be no more hospital beds. Amen? Isn't that, isn't that powerful? Isn't that good news? That is such good news. He calmed the sea and the storm. In the kingdom of heaven, there will be no, no more tsunamis that take out more than 225,000 people like what happened in 2004. There will be no more hurricanes like Hurricane Katrina or Andrew. There will be no more tornadoes. There will be no more earthquakes where people die and their homes are destroyed and their lives would never ever be the same. Those are all eliminated in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus showed this by his power and his control and his miraculous work over the wind and the waves. Jesus cast out demons. People would come to him with a demon in their soul and Jesus would speak a word and the demon would shriek and leave, which shows us that in the kingdom of God that there will be no more demonic influence. There will be no more evil uh, that takes place. In the kingdom of heaven, folks, we will never again see a demented, demon-possessed man take an automatic rifle and gun down innocent children as in Uvalde. Day, Texas. We will never again see a demented, demonic person fire on unsuspecting shoppers for no other reason than the color of their skin. Amen? Everything that I've just shared with you are signs of the kingdom of God. Every miracle Jesus did was a sign of the kingdom of God, showing us that in the kingdom of God, these things either will happen or they will no longer take place. It will be this perfect paradise. It'll be a perfect paradise. Here's the thing, though. The purpose of these miracles was to care for the needs of the people. That was the immediate purpose. He definitely wanted to care for the needs of the people. Their purpose was also to point people to a preferred future. Things are bad now. You're sick. You're lame. You're in trouble. You're demon-possessed. Hey, his healing showed, you know what? In the kingdom, there's a preferred future. There's a better place to be. Their purpose was also to get people's attention. He wanted to get their attention so that ultimately he could share with them the good news of the kingdom of God. But the most important thing he did was that to preach the good news. Not just to the poor financially, but to the poor in spirit, those who were poor spiritually, those, that is, who are far from God. His miracles demonstrated that the kingdom of God has already arrived, but it is not yet fulfilled. And that's a key theological theme throughout Scripture. It's called the already, but not yet. The kingdom has already come in Jesus, but it has not yet been fulfilled. So we today, right now, where we are, can experience the kingdom because Jesus initiated the kingdom when he came, but it's not yet fulfilled. It's not yet fulfilled. Jesus had come as a sacrificial lamb. He had come to die on the cross as a substitute for you and for me. He had come to pay the penalty for our sins. Your sins and my sins were paid for on the cross. Jesus came to redeem us from our brokenness. Is your life broken? Is your life heading in the wrong direction? Do you feel like everything is falling apart? Jesus is your answer. He wants to redeem you. To redeem means to rescue and restore. To rescue. He wants to rescue you from your circumstances. He wants to restore you. Restore you to a place of peace and joy and love. 
In verse 1 again, bringing this all the way back around, Jesus began preaching and announcing the good news of the kingdom of God. And as he traveled from town to town, Luke tells us that his 12 disciples were with him. That's the apostles that we've learned about in this study. Uh, The difference between all the disciples and uh, the 12 that were closest to him was they were apostles. All right? But this, was, but this was not just the boys' club traveling with Jesus. Back to the three women that we started with. Along with some women. So Jesus is traveling from village to village. He's got the 12 apostles with him, right? And then he's also got these women. And then there's other disciples as well that it doesn't name. It says among others. It just names three of the women, okay? And these women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. So women had come to Jesus because they had diseases, some kind maybe of of debilitating disease. We don't know what it was. One of the women, at least, Mary Magdalene, had seven demons in her. And Jesus had cast those demons out of her. And their love for him was so deep, their admiration for him was so full that they decided to travel with him in what's called an itinerant ministry, moving from town to town. Not only that, look what else it says. Among the women were Mary Magdalene, which, by the way, she was the first one to the tomb. Okay, if you, think, if you go and look at the um, resurrection stories at the end of the, of the Gospels, each of the Gospels, Mary Magdalene was the first one there, from whom he had cast out seven demons, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, That was Herod's business manager. You might remember from last week we talked about Herod who had beheaded John the Baptist. So Chusa was his house manager. So the gospel, the good news, had worked its way into the government. All right? Hey, that's good news, right? That's good news. Let's pray for the the kingdom of God to work its way into our government, right? We need that. We need that across the aisles. We need that. We need to see that here in America. And then there was Susanna. And this is the only time she's mentioned in all of Scripture. We know nothing else about her. And many others, it says, who were contributing. What were they doing? Contributing from their own resources to support Jesus and his disciples. These women were so thankful for their salvation. They were so thankful for being set free from demonic possession and disease that they traveled with Jesus' posse. As a matter of fact, they were now part of the posse. And if you know anything about first century um, uh, Roman Empire and the dichotomy between men and women, you will know that for women to be traveling along with men and to be treated as equals, as they clearly were here, was absolutely revolutionary. That was revolutionary. That's who Jesus is. Not only that, but they supported the work of the ministry financially. Folks, here's the thing. Everything costs money. You all know that, right? Anybody filled up their gas tank lately? You know, I mean, everything costs money. Think about this. You might remember from our study in Luke 4 that Jesus was tempted three times by the devil while he was alone in the wilderness. Now, hang with me, okay? This will all make sense in a moment. It's like, what? Wait a minute. How did we get to the temp? Okay, just hang in there. One of the temptations that the devil threw at Jesus was to turn stone into bread. Jesus had been fasting for 40 days. And so he was tempting him. You know, if you are the Son of God, turn this stone into bread. Jesus wouldn't do it. He didn't bite. He told that old devil that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus, now get this, Jesus self-imposed limits on himself and on his remarkable abilities. He would not use his power, he would not use his miraculous power to whip up a little champagne and caviar For him and the fellas. All right? He didn't do it for the devil. He wasn't going to do it in the middle of their their travels. That wasn't what he would do. That's not what his miraculous power was for. 
He and his disciples, they needed money to buy their food, to buy their drink, to buy their clothing and their housing. And they needed that money just like everybody else did. Jesus just wasn't going to go whoop, 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 you know, oh, look, we got a nice little paradise here to lay down. He didn't do that. He didn't and wouldn't do that. These ladies we've talked about were behind-the-scenes heroes. Let me ask you, have you been a behind-the-scene hero? Do you do work and ministry behind the scenes that no one else sees? What can you start doing or continue doing more so behind the scene to support the work of ministry here at Woodlands? You see, Woodlands is a kingdom of God church. We're all about the kingdom of God. We're an outpost, if you will, of God's greater kingdom here in Homewood. And that makes all who call Woodlands home, that makes you kingdom people. You're kingdom people. Living as kingdom people takes us to our next section. And that is the parable of the farmer scattering seed. Verse 4. One day Jesus told a story in the, form, in the form of a parable to a large crowd that had gathered from many towns to hear him. A farmer went out to plant his seed. As he scattered his seed across the field, some seed fell on the footpath where it was uh, stepped on, and the birds ate it. Other seed fell among rocks. It began to grow, but the plant soon wilted and died for lack of moisture. Other seed fell among thorns that grew up with it and choked out the tender plants. Still other seed fell on fertile soil. This seed grew and produced a crop that was a hundred times as much as had been planted. When he had said this, he called out, Anyone who has ears to hear should listen and understand. To explain this all, you need to understand that the farmer in the parable is Jesus. Jesus is the farmer that he's talking about. And today, you and I, in our, in our time frame, um, we become the farmers. All those of us who consider ourselves Christians, those of us who consider ourselves followers of Jesus Christ, we would consider ourselves his disciples. We become the farmers who are sowing the seed. The seed, of course, is the Word of God. Now, the entire Bible, folks, is considered the Word of God. Jesus himself is referred to as the Word become flesh in John 1.14. We have shown in previous messages here at Woodlands how the Holy Scriptures, both Old and New Testament, are the divinely inspired Word of God. You can go to our Explore God series on our website at woodlands.cc, or you can go to uh, our YouTube channel and just type in Woodlands Community Church Homewood, Illinois, and you can look up from 2019 uh, uh, the message number six titled, Is the Bible Reliable? If you want to learn more about that, explore God series, message number six, Is the Bible Reliable? But in the context of this chapter, verse one, Jesus began preaching and announcing the good news about the kingdom. The seed is being sown is specifically the good news, the gospel. Uh, and so again, what is the gospel? What is this seed? What is this good news? Well, in Acts 4.38, we get almost a perfect summary of what it means to share the gospel. Uh, check out this verse. You may want to write this down, you know, take a picture of this if you want to. Peter replied in the book of Acts, and by the way, when we finish Luke, we're going to go right into Acts. So we're going to get the life of Jesus, then right into the life of the early church. Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that's the gospel. We need to repent of our sins. We need to receive God's free gift of salvation. We need to be baptized. 
and we need to be filled with his Holy Spirit. That's the gospel. That's the seed that is being planted. There it is, folks, the gospel in one verse, Acts 4.38. Now, Jesus' disciples, they were apparently just as confused um, and, and, as we are when we first read uh, this parable, and like many of the other parables of Jesus, right? They're, I mean, when you first read them, you're just like, what? You know, and you get it when the disciples say, uh, I don't get it. Can you explain it to us? Um, and so, in verse 9, his disciples asked him what the parable meant. He replied, you are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of God. Now, if you're following along, you want to under, underline that word secrets or highlight it or write it down. This is a huge, this is a huge intro into a, a larger theology uh, here in the scriptures. This whole idea of of, of the secrets, the mystery, all right? The word secrets, it can also be translated mystery, um, refers to the kingdom of God. The original word is mysterion. That's the original Greek word. And the basic concept of mysterion is that the purpose and plan of God is being worked out phase by phase in human history and through the church which is making the mystery of God clearer and clearer over the course of time. You see, we have the advantage of building on the saints who have gone before us. We stand on their shoulders. We learn from their writings. We learn from their activity. We learn from their ministries. And little by little, God is continuing to unfold what he's doing. This is a very, very spiritual thing. This is one of those things that cannot fully be described in uh, human terms. You have to be in tune with the Holy Spirit of God to track along with this. You see, the, the issues like the problem of evil... Right? If you've ever had a discussion with someone who's not a Christian, one of the first things they bring up, well, if God's so good, why is there evil in the world? That's the problem of evil. Or the, um, or the suffering. You know, if God's so good, why do people suffer? Or what about the delay of, of justification? You know, being restored these things will be restored when God finally reveals his secret. All right? Now, I realize for some of you, you know, you're looking, your eyes are looking a little glazed over right now. You know, you're just, uh, stick with me, all right? Hang in there. Hang in there. Listen to how this comes together in the verses from Revelation chapter 10, verses 6 through 7. I don't have this on the screen, so if you've got your Bible, you want to open it up and follow along there, all right? Or your phone, if you, if you look on your phone, or just write it down and look it up later, okay? Revelation chapter 10, verses 6 and 7. In the book of Revelation, the apostle John, the same one who wrote the gospel of John, the disciple of Jesus, he says this, he swore an oath in the name of the one who lives forever and ever. So who's he describing? Well, look this. He created the heavens and everything in them, the earth and everything in it, the sea and everything in it. So he's talking about Jesus. He's talking about Jesus. So he's looking at Jesus, and he said, there will, uh, there will be <clears throat> no more delay. So in the revelation, we see the secret, the mystery of God is finally coming to fulfillment. There will be no more delay. When the seventh angel blows his trumpet, God's mysterious plan will be fulfilled. The mystery or the secret is only revealed by God's sovereign grace to his people. Let that soak in. The mystery or secret is only revealed to God by God's sovereign grace to his people. As Luke says here, verse 10, he replied, you are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of God. Jesus talking to his disciples, talking to the women that were there, they're asking about the parable, and he says, yes, I will explain it to you because you are permitted to understand the secrets 
of the kingdom of God. Verse 10, but I use parables to teach the others so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. When they look, they won't really see. When they hear, they won't understand. Boy, that's a confusing verse, isn't it? But he's quoting Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9. And it means that those who fail to respond, now get this, listen closely. Those who fail to respond to the saving word from God will find that they are not only under judgment for rejecting what they have heard, but that they are unable to understand further truth. If you've ever had a conversation with someone and you're trying to tell them about Jesus and you're trying to tell them how he died on the cross to save us from our sins and you're trying to tell them about how he was raised, he was resurrected, and that there's all kinds of proof behind that, that these things happened and that Jesus is the only way to salvation and that every other path that people take is a false path. And the people look at you and they think you're just straight up crazy. And they look and, and they're just like, that's the nuttiest thing I've ever heard in my life. This is what's going on. The secrets, the mysteries of the kingdom have not been revealed to them. And the reason they've not been revealed is because those people have rejected what they're hearing, like the different soils that this parable talks about. Is this making sense? Are you tracking with me? Verse 11, this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is God's word. The seeds that fell on the footpath represent those who hear the message only to have the devil come and take it away from their hearts and prevent them from believing and being saved. Now, as I'm getting into this, I'm also looking at the clock. Believe it or not, I do look at the clock. <laughs> I know that's news to a lot of you. Um, and uh, that may be a good point for us to stop right there. Let you ponder on that idea of the mysteries right? The mysterion, the secrets of God. And maybe even look in, read this passage over more next week and read some of the parallel passages. Mark and Matthew also tell the story of the parables and they have a few more different details. So you might want to read through that and see how they compare. And I'm going to pick this up at some point. I don't know. I may make it, I may make it into the, men's, uh, the uh, uh, Father's Day message next week. Or I may do something totally different. We'll see how the Holy Spirit leads, all right? So I'm going to wrap it up with that, um, which I apologize because I had a killer ending. I'm just saying, all right? Um, and, um, but we'll hold on to that for another day. Um, what I'm, I'm going to wrap us up in prayer, and then, Mike, you can make your way up uh, to send us out today. Let's pray together. Father God, we come to you in Jesus' name. And we thank you, O oh God. We thank you for how you have pieced together every part of your great mystery. That from the very beginning of time, you've been building a family. And that piece by piece, through the prophets, through John the Baptist, through Jesus, God in the flesh coming to earth, through his death, his burial, his resurrection, through the planting of your church, through the ups and downs of the church through history, the very, very good things the church has done to love people and serve people and to save people in the name of Jesus and to heal people. And along the way, Lord, the church has lost its way and done some very, very bad things. But through all of this, Lord, you remain steadfast. Lord, you remain committed to your church. She is your bride. And just as marriages go through very, very tough and difficult times, just as marriages have many ups and downs, shortcomings, 
times of joy, times of celebration, and yet times of brokenness and times of pain. Lord, that's your church. You've always been perfect, but we never are. So, Lord, we thank you for your grace to keep unveiling the mystery, phase by phase, making it clearer and clearer that you will, at some time, at some point, on one day, you will no longer delay. You delay now for one reason, and that's for more people to come to salvation. You love us that much. It just breaks your heart, I know, God, to see thee as one who is holy and perfect and true, to see the sinfulness of this world. But yet you wait patiently because you're still building your family. And you want people in your family from every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation. So you wait. And God, we got to do our job. We need your power, Holy Spirit, to share this good news. With all the people that we come in contact with. Everyone we know, our family, our friends, our co-workers, our neighbors. People in our natural path of life. Lord, you've put them in our lives so that we could be your ambassador. So that we can tell them the good news of how to be saved. And how to know that there is life after death. And that life after death will either be eternity in heaven or eternity in hell. And you've given us both the privilege and responsibility to tell everyone we know about it. So God, fill us up, I pray. Lead us, I pray, as we leave here today, Lord, as we go about our week. Empower us to share your message, your good news, wherever we go, with whomever we meet, with great joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. I'd like to release us with a, uh, uh, a benediction. If you will, please rise to be released. I'm going to read to you guys what's called the priestly blessing. Um, it's found in, uh, in the book of Numbers in the Old Testament. And we, we say this a lot. We, we, we close out service with the, priestly, with the priestly blessing a lot. But it's very important that we understand what this is, okay? Here, here's what it says, okay? The Lord said to Moses, and this is God speaking. He says, tell Aaron and his sons, the priests, this is how they are to bless the Israelites. Say to them. Then he goes on to read to say the, uh, the priestly blessing. So I'm going to say this to you, um, God's family. This, this, these words come directly from God. He says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And then God goes on to say, so they, the priests, will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. So I, I, I recited this, this blessing over you guys, and the Bible tells us that this blessing puts God's name on you so that he will bless you. Have a wonderful week. Thank you so much.